Okay, so I'm delighted to welcome uh, Professor Helen Roy today for uh, a talk about ladybirds. So celebrating ladybirds, developing our knowledge through citizen science. Um, we don't have time for me to go through all the amazing things that Helen's been involved with. Uh, I'm personally delighted that she's decided to give a talk. Helen's been an inspiration for me for a number of years since I first worked with her at a BioBlitz at Latitude Festival. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you now, Helen, to tell us all about your work with Ladybirds. And uh, yeah, over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Kieran. It's really wonderful to be with everyone um, this evening. And um, I have to say, Kieran, you've also been inspirational with your setting up of the Earthworm Society and all the wonderful work that you've done through the Field Study Council. And now these Ento Live um, webinars is really fantastic and great for people like me to have the opportunity to um, celebrate um, these taxonomic groups that we, we really love and um, ladybirds are certainly a huge um, passion for me and I think you'll sort of see hopefully through this talk also for many many other people and, and hopefully lots of you as well. So I'm going to talk very broadly about sort of biological recording and then I'm going to give um, some a few identification hints and tips and then talk about some of the research that's come through these amazing um, data sets that have been accrued over the years. So I'm based at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, but at the moment I'm in a hotel room in um, Cyprus because I'm doing um, some work on um, the sovereign base areas in Cyprus and actually more widely across Cyprus as well. Um, so I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as well since I'm sat in this hotel room. So first of all, to talk a little bit about um, the Biological Record Centre, and, and now it seems really appropriate that I have the atlas here um, for one of Garth's, one of the three atlases um, that Garth Foster has led um, for the, um, uh, the water beetle schemes. And um, they're really amazing, and I really, really recommend um, the atlases. I think they're just incredible um, resource of information and, and really highlight the passion of these people who um, bring together this knowledge. And um, to have created three volumes is, is really um, quite incredible. And I think that you know, with biological recording in the UK, it's inspiring to think how many different um, plants and animals um, people submit records for and incredible to think that this sort of spiral or is it a spiral well sort of circle of all of these names essentially all of the different um, recording schemes and societies that are run by volunteers and um, with data being submitted by volunteers and what a fantastic resource that gives to all of us to be able to explore in many many different um, ways and it's also incredible to think really that over the centuries, um, biological recording hasn't really changed that much. It's, it's really about being out and about and recording what we see, where we see it, when we see it, and, and putting our name beside that record. And of course, in the past, people would have recorded with um, with cards and you know, we've had the first atlases and now you're probably aware that in the last few weeks the online atlas for um, the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland has been launched and well, incredible to think that they've gone from the, the first paper atlas um, to produce this amazing, amazing online resource. And now also we've moved from recording cards to online recording and with smartphone apps being something that, that more and more people are using. But there's still a lot of pleasure to be had from going out with a notebook, of course, and, and jotting down um, our biological records. So this um, animation that I hope um, you can see is showing one year in the iRecord system of data coming in. And it's fantastic to see that coverage across the UK um, over the course of that year, and also to see the variety of taxa um, that are recorded. And this figure excites me because, of course, I see the invertebrates um, winning in terms of numbers of records. Um, but I'm sure some of you will be thinking, well, there must be more plant records and there's certainly going to be more bird records. And of course, you're right. This is just the data that's coming into iRecord. And of course, there are other data systems which are collating information um, for other groups. But it's really just to make the point that 
isn't it amazing how many records come in over the course of the year and how valuable that is to us in understanding um, patterns and trends in biodiversity, but also in informing um, policy and um, strategies for biodiversity, but also contributing hugely to research as well. So it's really um, with a huge amount of gratitude that I thank everyone who um, submits their records and um, this community of biological recorders that we have is really just just such a wonderful thing to be part of. And I, I don't know um, if this schematic is, is um, a good thing to be showing at this time of the evening for you, and you're probably wanting to, to, to relax a little more, but I think it's just to show the diversity of citizen science and the diversity of approaches that we can take. And it's sort of showing that when we look at sort of project stages from the design of a project through to having some outputs, whether they be an atlas or whatever they be, um, people can be involved as volunteers at various stages, but I think what's really very unique about biological recording is that, first of all, we're not aiming to, to answer one particular question necessarily. We might be, but we know that the data that we gather will have value for a whole variety of different questions, and who knows what those questions will be in the next um, 20 years. But I think it's incredible to think that when the Biological Record Centre was set up in the 1960s, and there was already an awful lot of data that had been accrued, but the, it was set up recognising the value of bringing all of these data sets together. But in the 1960s, we would never have had the idea of quite how many questions and how much in the way of science um, these biological records would contribute to. They're incredibly valuable. And also with the biological recording, many of the volunteers are really expert volunteers. They know a huge amount about the um, insects, for instance, that they are, are identifying and contribute so much um, to, to that science and to the informing of policy as well. And that, since I'm um, on Cyprus and I thought I'd mention the UK pollinator monitoring scheme because I think it's about to be now that you can get out and do some 10 minute timed counts and you never know you might be lucky enough to have a ladybird arrive on your flowers during that time count um, but I just wanted to give a real plug for the pollinator monitoring scheme that um, has been really attracting many many people to get involved with these flower insect time counts and they're really mindful activities of just counting everything that lands on the particular flower group that you choose or you could even adopt to one kilometer square and get involved um, in um, the pollinator monitoring scheme in a different way. And partly the reason I mention it while in, I'm in Cyprus is we were able to use the methods that were developed for the UK pollinator monitoring scheme to launch a pollinating scheme um, for Cyprus. And one of the things I've been doing while I've been over here is working with um, Kelly Martineau and her, her wonderful team um, to look at some of the data that's been coming through on the Cyprus pollinator monitoring scheme. So I really encourage you to get involved with the uh, flower insect time counts. And if you come over to Cyprus at any time, you can do the same for what's called Pomsky over here and um, also contribute some flower insect time counts um, while you're in Cyprus. So on to the ladybirds, and I just want to, I love this photo, and if anyone's heard me give a talk before, they've almost certainly seen it, but I just love that all of those ladybirds are huddled into that little hole in that concrete post, and in some senses that shows a real sort of urban nature of some ladybirds, and I think there's many, many reasons why we love ladybirds, but one of the things is that they are around us, we do see them, and I saw in the chat that people are seeing their first ladybirds, and if you're like me and it's so exciting to start to see things stirring at this time of year and um, to see the ladybirds waking up is, is a really um, wonderful um, thing. So back in um, 2005, we launched um, the Ladybird Survey website and online recording for um, ladybirds. It seems really remarkable to me now that that was the first online recording that we had within the UK. I mean, it is now nearly um, 20 years ago. And we did it in because the Harlequin Ladybird had just arrived, had first been recorded. And um, working with Mike Majurus, I was on sabbatical with him at the time, we saw this opportunity to really promote Ladybird recording and explain a little more about biological invasions and um, invasive non-native species. And um, 
we were really fortunate to have some funding by DEFRA and support through the Biological Record Centre to give it a go and launch an online recording scheme. And it's been a really exciting 20 years of online recording um, for the Ladybird Survey. And I will say that the many photos that I'll be showing are contributions from volunteers submitting records. And you know, when I go into iRecord and do some verification, and apologies, we're a little bit behind at the moment. I don't think that far behind, maybe a month or so, but um, it's just a joy to see people's photos alongside their records and just get a, a hint of what's happening all around the countryside um, with the ladybirds. And um, one of the things we've also done alongside having the online recording, and I should say that Peter Brown um, co-leads the UK Ladybird Survey with me. Very sadly, Mike Majerus um, died and Peter and I continued um, on the survey. Um, and we've done an awful lot of promotion along the way. And again, inspired by Mike Majerus, who was always very happy talking about ladybirds and um, sharing his enthusiasm and certainly did a huge amount for me in terms of mentoring me through my PhD and um, helping me to be able to um, rear these little beetles, which can be a bit complicated at times. Um, but that sharing um, our passion and um, excitement for these really wonderful beetles um, and encouraging people to submit their sightings and to help to unravel the ecology. And often I think, you know, we think with ladybirds, maybe we know most things there is to be known about ladybirds, but there's always new things to be found out. And um, it's really um, exciting to have discoveries on our doorsteps and to hear um, new things that people are finding out about ladybirds. So just to um, give a quick overview of why a ladybird is a ladybird or what makes a ladybird a ladybird. Um, so they are beetles. And so like all the beetles, they have the elytra, the wing cases extending over their membranous wings. And um, they also have biting mouth parts. But then with as the family of ladybirds within the wider group of beetles, they're small to medium sized beetles. They're usually round or oval. They're often brightly colored and patterned. They have 11 segments in their antennae, if you care to count. Um, their feet have four segments, but the third is so small that only three are invisible from most of the species. So they're the kind of details that make a ladybird a ladybird. But I think often, even when we see a ladybird that we haven't seen before, we recognize it as being ladybird-like. Those short antennae really separate it out from the leaf beetles, from the chrysomelids, which can also look a little bit ladybird-like. Or maybe the chrysomelid people will say that the um, ladybirds are looking quite chrysomelid-like. But I think you know what I mean. They look quite ladybird-like. And if you look at this structure at the back of the head, um, the pronotum is a really important structure for um, identifying ladybirds. I don't know if my um, mouse is working, but this structure here. And um, here it's white with the um, black speckles on it. It's broader than long and extends forward at the, the margins and it's often patterned. And the reason why it's really useful for identification is because some of the ladybirds really vary a lot in their um, coloration of the um, wing cases but the um, pronotum marking is often quite conserved. So it's a more reliable feature um, to use um, for identifying ladybirds quite often. So ladybirds have a complete um, metamorphosis. So they have eggs and larvae. The larvae go through four instars. So there's the first instar, shed skin second, shed skin third, shed skin fourth, and then they become a pre-pupa and then they become the full pupa and then out emerges the adult beetle. So for the seven spot ladybird, there's one generation in a year. And it's about now, as we're seeing in the chat, that ladybirds are beginning to wake up and people are starting to see the seven spot ladybirds. They would have been over the seven spot in particular. So they all choose slightly different places to spend the winter months. The seven spots would have been in the leaf litter mainly. And um, they start appearing and coming up on the warmer days above the leaf litter or maybe up um, on some branches of a, of a um, shrub or hedge. And um, when it's cold again, they just go back into the leaf litter at the moment. So they're up and down a little bit, but they are beginning to stir. And very soon they'll start to mate. Um, and then they will lay their eggs. 
and then that generation of ladybirds, adults, will die. So there's this time through June and early July where for the seven spot ladybirds particularly, but others as well at certain, about that time, we just see lots and lots of larvae. And then those larvae become the next generation of adults and it's them that then spend the winter. So all of the ladybirds in Britain overwinter as adult beetles. The seven spot ladybird can just have this one generation, even if we have a long and lovely extended summer, um, because they need a cold period over winter in order to become reproductively mature. And that's not the case for every ladybird species, and that's not the case for the harlequin ladybird, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a while. But this is the, the life cycle um, of the seven spot ladybird, Coxnella septum punctata. And here is the seven spot ladybird. And um, it's a very widespread species, it's a very common species. And actually, having said that many ladybirds vary in um, their color pattern formation, the seven spot ladybird is really quite conserved in terms of its color patterns. So you can see that promotor marking with the black and the white patches on it. That's how it always looks. It has these two little white patches just in front of that um, spot that's in the center there near what's called the scutellum and then it has three spots on either side so it has the seven the seven spots and actually ladybirds worldwide get their name mainly from this iconic ladybird and um, the lady part refers to our lady as in mary and in historic paintings mary was depicted in a red ca cape hence the red elytra, and the um, seven spots are thought to represent the seven joys and seven sorrows of um, Mary. So essentially it is our ladybird, and in many countries around the world translated um, to be lady, our lady's bird, or our lady's beetle, or our lady's bug in some places. So that is the very beautiful seven spot ladybird, and I worked a lot in lots of different ladybirds through my PhD, but the seven spot was the one I did the most work on and um, I still get very excited to see them. So here is the two spot ladybird and this is one of the species that's very color pattern variable. Um, it's a species I'll come to in a little while that we're seeing it has been in decline. Um, I have this big arrow pointing to the leg color can be really helpful sometimes. So it's got black legs. When it's in its red color form of the two black spots, which is its typical color form, you can sort of see it has almost like an M shape on that pronotum. And again, white markings flanking that um, M shape. When it is in its um, melanic color form, the thing to look out for here is those front red markings, so sort of splodgy red marking at the front, goes all the way to the edge of the elytra. So that's a really important thing because there's going to be some other ladybirds that look quite like it, but the, that splodge, if you like, doesn't go down to the edge of the wing case. Also a widespread species, but less common certainly than it was when, well, considerably less common and much more contracted in its range um, more recently. So this is a close relative of um, Adelia bipunctata, Adelia decimpunctata, another really colourful um, pattern variable ladybird. Actually, I think I found this one today in the Environment Centre at Aquaterian in Cyprus, but um, I'm just going to check it out because I'm somewhere different, so it could be something different. But it's a very colour pattern variable. Um, but again, you can sort of see, although the, the really dark one sort of pushes back on this, um, but the, you can see it's got a speckly kind of pronotum. It's got a sort of M shape, but it's not fully joined up. It's like a speckled M shape rather than the solid M shape of the two spot ladybird. And it's typical form. It has one spot on either shoulder, then a row of three, three spots on either side, and then um, the other spots towards the back. And that's the typical form. And it often has a sort of pale pale line right around the edge of the wing cases. It's got brown legs. So remembering that Adelia um, bipunctata have black legs, Adelia decimpunctata has the brown legs. And then it's quite common to see it in that top form that you can see on the left, this sort of checkered form. Um, and um, reasonably common to see it with this form um, bimaculata that like, has a sort of um, red line on, on the shoulder. But again, on that, really dark color form. You can still see it's got some white on the pronotum, even if it doesn't have that speckled um, M shape. 
So here we have the harlequin ladybird, and it can look really like the ten spot ladybird, particularly in the typical form, but also um, it, yeah, it can look it when it gets few spots on the very dotty um, color form as well. Um, and but take a look on the shoulder. It's got two spots usually on either shoulder. I know it's not his shoulder, but you know what I mean. And then it has four rows of um, spots. So it is, it is bigger. It's, I mean, it's much, much bigger than the 10 spot ladybird, but it does have brown legs. I don't know if you can make it out, but on the, with the mating pair on the um, male, the, the black ladybird with the four red spots, there's a ridge at the back. That's very characteristic of the harlequin ladybird as well, but sometimes it's a bit tricky to see. You need to kind of get it in the right lighting. So this is just to show you the, the difference between the harlequin ladybird and the 10 spot ladybird, but size really, really matters here. But also just these spot markings can, can really be um, very different. But we, you know, people do record um, harlequin ladybirds as 10 spots and 10 spots as harlequins. Please don't ever worry if you're submitting a record, um, just give it your best go put the photo in and Peter or I will take a look. And um, if it is the other one, we'll just explain to you um, where the difference lies. Um, but please don't ever hesitate to just submit your records and we can always check them out. It's always good to hear from you. Actually, I should say this is Pete Brown's favorite ladybird. It's uh, the 22 spot ladybird. And the others I've just been showing you are all predatory ladybirds feed, that feed largely on aphids. This is a mildew feeding ladybird and it's very, very bright yellow and very, very speckly. This is the um, 14 spot ladybird, um, Propylia. It's, it's um, pronotum marking. I was asking, I was lecturing to at Reading University just about ladybirds, a pleasure I had to do that. And I was saying to them, I always struggle to know what to describe that pronotum marking as. And I sort of sometimes think of it as like a colored in fist or something. And one of the students said to me, they think it looks like Shrek. So actually now, now they've said that. Another one said it looks like a cloud, um, but yeah, you, you can see what they mean, but it's a very solid marking and it looks very different to the other ones that we've seen. So sometimes this ladybird can look very like the 10 spot ladybird, but that pronotum marking always sets it apart. Very square spots and another aphid feeding ladybird here. These are the Trilocarini. I absolutely love the Trilocarini. I think they're absolutely stunning. So that's the panel at the top of the Trilocarini. We have the kiddie spot, the heather ladybird, and the pine ladybird. And the thing to notice with these ones, they don't have any white markings at all. And they almost look like little bowler hats. They're scale insect feeding um, ladybirds, and they're adapted to prize the scale insects um, off their, their leaves or, or the trunk of a tree. Um, really stunning ladybirds. And pine ladybirds are one of the earliest emerging in spring. So we'll be starting to see those in quite large numbers. And they have this comma, the red comma on their shoulders that's really, really distinctive. The heather ladybird is a little bit more tricky to find and very common on heathland, but kidney spots you'll find in lots and lots of different places. They can look a little bit like harlequins, but they don't have any white markings at all. And the harlequin always has these white markings. Again, they're quite a lot smaller um, than the harlequin. Here's the wonderful orange ladybird, Halesia, mildew feeding um, ladybird. And um, I'll often have lots of different favorite ladybirds, probably because they're all, all favorites, but I, this is a stunning ladybird. And it's one that we get a lot of records all through the year, through the winter months as well. Um, it stays a little bit active. It's feeding on the mildews on leaf surfaces and its larvae are often the last ones to be around because their development is just quite slow on that mildew. But um, well, gosh, it must be one of the most beautiful beetles, surely, I think. And it can look really like the cream spot, which is also a very beautiful beetle. Um, but if you have a look, it has this very sort of translucent edge. And also if you look at its spots, the spots are sort of arranged in almost neat rows from front to back, not quite so neat. But the um, cream spot is their spots are arranged in really neat rows going across them. Um, I mean, they do look a different color mostly, but they are again, another species very, they're very easily confused with one another. So in terms of going, that was a, just a quick view of some of the ladybirds. And we have got um, a ladybird field guide that we produced fairly recently with um, 
Richard Lewington doing all of the illustrations and well, I get to do many really privileged things in, in my life with, with insects um, and uh, working with um, Richard Lewington and Pete Brown to, to work on that field guide was just incredible. Um, so I don't know if you have it, but you might like to get it. And um, it has all of the ladybirds illustrated within it. So it's about 47 species. And that includes um, the about 20-ish that are the tiny, tiny ladybirds that don't look so ladybird-like. And I'm gonna come on to those in a moment, um, but it also includes the latest um, trends. But this slide is just to show you that, you know, you may have a sweep net and you can go out sweeping for ladybirds like Pete is doing in his um, woolly boots on the right hand side or one of our wonderful volunteer recorders um, who um, sadly died a few years ago, Bob Frost, he's out with a white umbrella and just using it as a beating tray. So anything goes with the ladybird recording really. And sometimes when I've taken out groups, I put the nets and the beating trays away and we start to see far more just taking a look by eye at the underside of leaves or just walking along um, paths and tracks. So here are some of the resources um, that you can use. The FSC charts um, are really excellent ways to, to begin to get into the conspicuous ladybirds. And we have one for the um, larvae as well. So you can't identify the larvae when they're really tiny, but by the time they get to their sort of third or fourth instar, um, they are quite straightforward to identify. Um, we have lots of information on the website. Um, we're using the iRecord app now, actually. I should have changed that. We're not using the European Ladybird one quite so much, although it's got a field guide on it. So if you want to download it, it's great for the field guide, but the recording part isn't working quite so well at the moment. So we switched onto um, iRecord, or maybe some of you are using um, iNaturalist and we exchange records. And then this is the field guide to ladybirds um, of Britain and Ireland. And as I said, it's just stunningly um, illustrated by Richard Lewington. I don't think Pete and I really needed to write any words. It could have just been a, a picture book and it would have been, it's absolutely beautiful. And I think that there's many wonderful things about um, co organizing the ladybird survey with with um, Pete Brown and, and getting to hear from so many people about their records and the stories around the sightings that they have and that feedback and that kind of sense of um, community is I find it's really important and even when we're online we can still have that sense of community of course it's lovely to all go out in the field together or to have a field workshop um, but it's amazing how much we can communicate with one another whether it be through social media um, or through iRecord. And um, actually on iRecord, I'll often have a chat with people about one thing or another when they're sending um, their records in. I hope I'm not cluttering up the um, comments field within iRecords too much for everybody. But this is um, one example that I really love of some feedback. So um, person we sit on um, Twitter, really um, avid ladybird recorder. Um, one Sunday evening, he posted a, a sighting and he said, I'm not sure about this ladybird, not one I've seen before, about five millimeters, black legs, brown basic color, hieroglyphic question mark. And um, he tagged me and um, Simon Robson. And I was kind of a bit uncertain because it's really difficult from just a photo for some things. And the hieroglyphic ladybird is one that I struggle to see quite a lot. So I know, you know, it's not really, really common. Um, but um, I said, well, that's really fantastic, but I think the habitat you've given suggests that it, it's probably a two spot, not a hieroglyphic ladybird. Let's check it out with um, Richard Comont. So I dragged Richard Comont into the, into the discussion and he said, um, we need to see the prosternum. So this is a sort of structure underneath, um, underneath the body of the ladybird. And um, then, so basically we're saying it's very tricky from a photo. But Poe went out into his garden, he found the same ladybird the next day, took the photo and there it is. Yes, it's a hieroglyphic ladybird from a garden in Edinburgh. So all the times I'm trying to find it on Heathland and there it was in, in someone's back garden. Now we've had a few more back garden records um, from Edinburgh. Um, so yeah, really, for me, really exciting and just a lovely way to spend a Sunday evening unraveling um, a ladybird and into the Monday. But also um, with Twitter, 
Twitter, it could be, or other social media, it can be a really wonderful way to engage um, young people as well. And this is a school sending me a message to say, we're doing a ladybird um, survey today and me saying, please do send me lots of questions and yeah, feeling a little bit part of the, the ladybird day, which looked really great. And actually this is on um, St. Helena. So I've been really fortunate and I'm doing quite a lot of work on um, the UK overseas territories with respect to invasive non-native species and biological invasions. And I was on St. Helena in the, the Middle Atlantic Ocean. They don't have any um, native ladybirds, but they do have quite a lot of um, introduced ladybirds, um, including one that has been essentially heroic in saving their um, gumwood forest because it's feeding on a, um, an insect there, um, the jacaranda bug, um, and doing really well at managing just that bug. So it's a very good example of a successful biological control um, agent. But anyway, the plane couldn't get back to collect um, me, and this is Tim Adrian's in the photo as well, and we had a, a group of um, ecologists over with us and we were stranded for a week. Um, so we just made local contact with the primary school and we had some really lovely sessions chatting about insects and chatting about ladybirds um, with um, the children there. So I think that in terms of, as I was saying earlier on, sometimes we can think that um, we maybe we know everything about Ladybirds are a very well-known group of insects, um, but this was a discovery on my own doorstep. And well, it's now 10 years old, but nevertheless, I'm still very excited by um, this um, first county record for Oxfordshire. It's my only first county record for ladybirds, well, for anything. <laughs> Pretend I have any other first county records. Um, and it's Gymnus interruptus. And um, it's one of these little tiny ladybirds that don't look quite so ladybird-like. Um, it has this big kind of, patch, a sort of almost triangular patch of red um, that extends down to the edge of the wing cases. And it's a very hairy little dark um, ladybird, just absolutely stunning. And um, we have many, many, many records coming in every year. And um, it's just really fantastic. I think we're getting maybe 25,000 um, records a year. So it's a really, really wonderful data set um, with records coming in all across um, the UK. This is a really lovely water ladybird, and it's one that uh, I try to find very often and don't find it very often. And then I hear from other people within iRecord and they see many, many of them. Um, I think it's when you find it, you can find it in really hard numbers, but it's just a case of trying to find it. So this is just to show how the records have changed over time. And, and um, BRC was established in the 1960s. The Cox Melody recording scheme was an early scheme established in the 1970s. And then Mike Majurus ran the Cambridge Ladybird Survey and um, John Muggleton had been before him. And there had been you know, fantastic people um, organizing um, recording of ladybirds. And we've had this leap in recording not really because of Peter and I, just because online recording makes everything so much easier for people. Um, so we both really feel we sort of stand on the shoulders of the giants who went before us and we've benefited massively from these technologies that allow people to much more um, actively engage with Ladybird recording. And we did have a first app on I, I record and, and a Ladybird app, um, but now we're using the general iRecord app, which I, I really recommend, it's very, very good. And we can see that um, this is just some graphics that have come from the records fairly recently um, for last year that we can see um, the numbers of records that we get um, every week, in this case for the Harlequin Ladybird, the Seven Spot Ladybird and the Two Spot Ladybird. And what's quite nice is for the, you can see these really strong peaks um, for the Harlequin Ladybird of that um, early sort of summer peak. And then that sort of autumn peak when the Harlequin Ladybird adults are starting to head into people's um, houses. So Charlie Uthwaite, who's a PhD student at um, the UK Centre for College of Hydrology, has run um, some models for many, many different species to look at the trends. And as is the case for quite a number of um, insect groups that we hear about, um, we can see quite a few species um, in decline. So Adelia bipunctata, I already mentioned, has really been quite widespread, but is really showing quite a substantial distribution decline. So here are all the species for which we're seeing a decline in um, their distribution 
um, over time, including some of the tiny ones, um, such as the Thorus um, is now Pusillus, but um, it, we could think, well, maybe these tiny ones are under-recorded, but the models are really quite robust. And um, so we do believe this is a, is a, is a true picture of um, the state of, of ladybirds at the moment. Of course, there's some that are increasing, and Halesia is a really interesting one, the orange ladybird, because it was thought to be really associated with ancient woodlands, but we're seeing it in many, many places now. And we don't know why that is, whether there's been a sort of slight warming of the climate that's benefited it, um, whether it's sort of switched to feed on a whole variety of different mildews. We really, really don't know, but we have seen a really amazing expansion of Halesia. And then these other ones are new species arriving. And, and actually we have other rhizobias now that have arrived um, within the UK. So here we have Chrysomaloides and Lefante. We already had um, Rhizobius latura within our species list. Um, and Rhizobius latura and Rhizobius chrysomaloides look really, really similar. But again, just like I said with the hieroglyphic ladybird, you can separate them out on the, um, the, the marking on the prosternal um, keel. And of course, the harlequin ladybird has been spreading. And I showed that photo of the um, harlequin because you can you see the little yellow fruiting bodies on the wing case. Um, that's a really amazing fungus called it's a labobenialian fungus. And um, actually, there's been some really amazing work by someone called Danny Harewaters. He's been looking at the association of these little fungi with specific species of ladybirds, and seeing that what we thought was one um, species of fungus is actually a few different species. So it has its very own um, fungus. That was a complete aside for the fungus, but I do love that fungus. So yes, Charlie led on this work for many, many species um, to publish the trends um, for them using some quite complex modeling, um, Bayesian occupancy modeling um, to do this, um, but really, really valuable for us in terms of understanding the patterns and trends of ladybirds. And we've published those trends also within the Ladybird Field Guide. I thought I'd just spend a little bit of time talking about some of the research that's largely been done by um, PhD students using the Ladybird survey data. Um, but um, Richard Comon did some amazing work while he was um, doing his PhD. Maybe some of you now know him through his work with the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, um, but I was fortunate enough to be one of his supervisors for his PhD, and he was looking at traits of ladybirds and looking at their distribution change and what might be affecting their distribution. And um, he um, showed a variety of patterns to do with their traits. So he showed that very large species that um, have many generations, or not many, they only have a couple of generations, were less likely to colonize new places. And that when the climate when you're looking at the climate data, that if there was very rainy grid squares, they were likely to be less um, likely to be colonized. Um, and urban, we often think of many of the ladybird species as being quite urban, and some of them are, some of them really thrive in urban um, environments, but many of them don't. Many of them are more specialist, um, for example, on heathlands. Um, and I'm going to come to the five spot ladybird in a minute to talk about his very, very specialized habitats. Um, so actually the increase in urban land covers um, resulted in an increase in local extinction rates and reduced um, likelihood of colonization by species. But one of the things that he showed that supported from analysis that we had already done was that um, overlapping with Harmonia axoridis greatly increased extinct local extinction rates, this is, of um, other ladybirds. Um, so, for example, then we see a contraction in their range. And I will just mention this other study um, that Beth Perth led, but with a master's student, Claire Kessel. And um, Claire pulled out all of the color pattern data from the Ladybird um, data set. And we looked at how color morphs um, do slightly, slightly different things. There wasn't a lot of difference between the different color morphs in terms of the Harlequin Ladybird and how they behave in terms of their response to landscape and climate factors. But it did seem that um, the um, Sixinia color form, the orange one with the black spots, didn't do quite so well in darker habitats like pine forests, for instance. There might be a little tantalizing hint that something's happening with some sort of thermal warning, warming, such that maybe the melanic ladybirds could warm up more, more quickly and more easily. But um, that's very speculative at the moment and anecdotal, just some of the, the thoughts that we had while we were mulling through some of that analysis. 
lots to be tested, lots to be discovered. And I will now just come to talk about um, the Harlequin ladybird and what it's taught us around um, biological invasions. So just to give um, some definitions, when I'm talking about non-native species or alien species, these are species that have been introduced from one part of the world to another part of the world by humans. And it's that by humans that's really important. So maybe they've been introduced for pest control, maybe they've been introduced for ornamental purposes, all kinds of reasons. So the briny ladybird, which is pictured here, very, very cute larva that you can see there in the picture as well, um, was first seen in the mid 1990s in um, Surrey in someone's back garden. It's not a strong flyer. It was almost certainly carried on some kind of plant or alongside people some way hitchhiking or stow as a stowaway. It only feeds on white briny and it's really had quite slow spread. It's slightly further than this map now, but not very far at all. But we would class that as a non-native or an alien species. It's not one that we are concerned is going to do anything. In fact, for people like me, it's a really welcome addition to the ladybird checklist so we can go and take a look at it. And indeed, when it not long after it had first arrived, I drove to a car park in Guildford um, to find it. I now can find it very near to my house. So um, that's a lot more convenient, but it was very nice to go and see it in that early stage. But in contrast, this is the harlequin ladybird. So we use the term invasive before non-native or alien to refer to the subset of all of those non-native species that threaten biodiversity, ecosystems, or the way we live. The harlequin ladybird, the briny ladybird just feeds on white briny. The harlequin ladybird feeds on aphids, it feeds on other insects, it feeds on soft fruit. It's a very, very generous ladybird, very prolific in terms of numbers of offspring, has a couple of generations a year. And this map, this animation by Tom August, you can see the spread of the harlequin ladybird. And thanks to people submitting their records after we launched that online survey in 2005, we were able to track the spread of the harlequin ladybird in a lot of detail. And it spread at about 80 to 100 kilometers per year, really, really dramatic. And you would have seen that um, spread lighting up that map as it um, went across from the first records in Essex and then um, spreading um, very, very, very rapidly. So we knew that when it arrived, there wasn't anything that could be done about it, but we were concerned about um, the threat to um, biodiversity, the threat to other ladybirds. So one of the things we we're able to do with all of the ladybird data that had already been gathered, we were able to look at um, whether or not there was any correlation with the arrival of the harlequin ladybird and change in distribution trends of some of these other species. So we had eight species and we worked um, with people in Belgium and also in Switzerland um, using their data sets. And this figures here show the data for Belgium and for um, the for um, the UK with the black lines being the UK lines and each panel being a separate ladybird species. And this would take a message from all of them. It's the distribution trends over time with time on the um, x-axis. We can see that the hash line is in the presence of the harlequin ladybird and the dark line, solid line is without the harlequin ladybird. And without the harlequin ladybird for the UK, the two spot ladybird was seeing quite a gentle sort of increase, probably quite stable population. But the harlequin ladybird, um, arrival has had really um, correlated with a very steep decline in two spot ladybirds. And in fact, we can see declines across all of those species other than the seven spot ladybird. And it's um, a consequence of competition, but also predation. So for example, the two spot ladybird, the harlequin ladybird outcompetes it. They really like living in the same places and deciduous trees. And the um, Two spot ladybirds. So ladybirds are very well chemically defended on the whole. The two spot ladybird not so well chemically defended, and it can the pupil stage and immature stages in particular just get eaten. So it's had this 44% decline in distribution. And we're trying to unravel what does this mean for the ecosystem function and resilience. Of course, it's very sad to see these declines and very concerning. But what does that really mean in terms of um, a, a bigger picture as well? So we've been thinking a lot about um, ecological networks, and this is um, some work that I did with people um, in South Africa, Kang Hoi leading the work, um, looking at using sort of mathematical models to be able to think about um, these ecological networks. And you know, the harlequin ladybird sits there 
amongst a whole variety of the aphids, the other things that are feeding on the aphids, the lacewing larvae, the little um, pathogenic fungi, all of the other ladybirds, the parasitic wasps, and how it interacts with those um, is, a, is a huge interest. And I have a PhD student, Simeon Wilton, at the moment, who's exploring some of these interactions at the moment, particularly with the Asian hornet, Vespa velatina, but he's going to be looking at the harlequin ladybird a little bit as well. So I thought I'd mention another study, um, perhaps a, a brighter news story from um, another PhD student, Rachel Farrow, who was working with Pete and I, and she did a lot of field work on um, Coxinella quinquique pantata, the five spot ladybird. It's a remarkable little ladybird that really likes to live along fast flowing rivers on the river shingle. It's another one that uh, Pete and I traveled a long way to go and see it in Wales and uh, I don't know, you probably would have heard our shriek of excitement, or at least my shriek of excitement when I saw it for the first time. A really, really lovely ladybird. I have to say it looks very like a seven spot with just two less spots. But it's amazing to watch it on the river shingle, just sort of scurrying around and feeding on aphids on little bits of sprigs of vegetation in amongst the river shingle. And uh, Rachel did some field surveys to look at whether or not there was overlap with the Harlequin ladybird and um, the five spot ladybird. And the good news was that there was quite a separation, that there weren't that many um, Harlequin ladybirds within the five spot um, ladybird um, habitat. And um, it seems that um, the, the habitat is not so suitable for the Harlequin. I just thought I'd now mention a couple of surveys further afield because um, ladybird people around the world are really lovely people and Pete and I have had the opportunity to collaborate um, very widely and this is us in um, Chile um, with Audrey and Tanya who run the ladybird survey for Chile and um, we were able to compare um, sort of approaches to citizen science and we also went out and did some field work and we thought it would be really fun to go up into the Andes and see how high we could find Harlequin ladybird records and we got the highest record at 3,578 meters above sea level. I believe that one of um, Audrey's students then went the following couple of weeks and went even higher and still found the harlequin ladybirds at that height it was they were feeding within these kind of cushion plants and just anything any little invertebrate that they could find um, they were thriving up there so also um, there is a ladybird survey in argentina for the harlequin ladybird and victoria verenkraut came to um, ceh and spent six months with us and she set up this amazing amazing survey and um, last year at the International Congress of Entomology, it was really wonderful to meet up again and to hear the progress um, that she's making. And she's using WhatsApp, for instance, as well as iNaturalist to do this recording, but she's made the most beautiful resources. She got a small grant um, from National Geographic and she's been out around Argentina to many different villages and really been promoting ladybird recording and getting people excited um, to be recording ladybirds. And as a consequence, has got an amazing um, data sets building up already. I just thought I'd very quickly mention something around new technologies. So there's a lot going on at the moment with new technologies, with using AI for identification. And, and maybe some of you who've been submitting records to um, iRecord and I'm being a bit slow might be thinking they can't wait for the AI to take over from me and be doing the identification. And we have been looking at whether there's a possibility at least to do some filtering of the records um, using AI. And it works quite well for ladybirds if you put some extra kind of metadata in there, if you know a little bit more information, it can work quite well, but I think it's gonna get better and better. And certainly, you know, it won't be long before it will be very reliably identifying um, seven spot ladybirds that are coming through, for instance. But there's also a lot of new technologies that are coming through that can help us with insect monitoring, perhaps in places where it's not easy for us to get to. So there are now um, AI moth traps um, that are really developing and taking off um, very, very well. Um, and we've been recently working with others to just begin to think about the possibilities and potential um, for these new technologies um, as opportunities to advance citizen science, but really recognizing that still that joy of being out in the field and, and recording, there's, there's nothing quite like it. So just to, to um, summarize the biological records that so many people have been providing um, including many of you, I'm sure, have just been really, really critical in allowing us to assess patterns and trends in the distribution of many, many species. 
we know that ladybird distribution patterns, like many insects, are very dynamic species going up and down, huge population cycles. Some of us, I mean, my first memories of the mid-1970s and that huge number of seven-spot ladybirds that actually would like to have a few 11 spots in there as well, but I was only six at the time. So I rely on other people to tell me the details for that one, but I do remember the numbers. But if we look at the longer term patterns, we can see that there are many species declining. There are some that are just stable and there are a few that are increasing. New technologies might provide us with some opportunities, opportunities for training and feedback and perhaps faster responses um, to recorders. Um, but the joy of celebrating biodiversity together through biological recording is, um, for me, just um, immense and just really wonderful to have the opportunity to be with you all tonight and wonderful to have the opportunity um, to, to be recording ladybirds. And I maybe if you've already recorded all of the charismatic ones, we'll carry on recording those. They're all charismatic, I should say. But perhaps you might, if you haven't already, got into these little tiny ladybirds like Nevis quadrimaculatus, like... Um, Stathorus and um, all the little skimnids and others. Um, there, there is a world out there of new ladybirds for you to see, I'm sure. So thank you very much to Kieran and all the EntoLife team and all of the sponsors that he mentioned. I'm actually just to yeah, clarify, I'm the past president of the Royal Entomological Society and I really recommend it to you all. And I really recommend also um, the British Entomological Natural History Society. I keep meaning to join and I might well do it straight after this meeting because I think it is really fantastic as Kieran said. But thank you also um, to the Chalk and Chase um, Landscape Project too.